Boom, and we're live. Let's talk about love again for a second time. I have the pleasure of speaking with Alex Priel, with whom we're going through one of the greatest works of philosophy ever produced, the Symposium by one named Plato. And the subject of the Symposium is love, eros, in ancient and modern Greek, and like all these great books, there's much, much more than, than, than meets the eye in the beginning. In the first part of this two-part uh, episode, we delved into the differences between the ancient and modern understanding and why it's so important when understanding things like love, like Eros, uh, whereby the modern uh, post-Descartes type of understanding is about breaking things down and understanding the components but perhaps by doing so, you're missing something of the actual thing that you're trying to investigate. And when it comes to love, I think this breaking down becomes even the more apparent. This is On Tyranny, the radio branch of Ancient Greece Revisited. You can find us on Facebook, where we make short documentaries on Ancient Greece, trying to tackle it from a very novel and hopefully very dissident perspective. So without further ado, let's dive once again to this great book. Alex, thank you very much for being here for a second time. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me a second time. <laughs> so the first time we went through the whole setting of the symposium, and uh, for people who are just jumping in that second part, which they're very welcome to do, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction. The symposium is one of the Platonic or Socratic dialogues. Uh, featuring Socrates as one of the lead characters and it features a relatively uh, standard, you could say, format of these dialogues whereby you have Socrates and you have uh, a group of people around him and they're trying to understand a single word almost. Uh, a lot of Plato's works, if not most of them, um, try to unpack, try to understand a single word, justice courage, love, what is it? Words that we use very commonly. And usually what you have is that um, the people who are gathered around Socrates start speaking first and they give a definition of what they think. In the case of the symposium, they give a definition of what they think love is. And they're not bad definitions. Um, the way I was taught at school, you know, in Greece, is that uh, Socrates is almost like speaking to these insects, you know, or that know nothing. Although, but that's not what jumps out of the dialogues if you actually read them. The the opinions of these people are well thought, and they're at least opinions that are very commonly held. Uh, whether they're philosophic or not, it's uh, not as important, perhaps. Their opinions that are commonly heard. Even today, if you go out on the street, you meet people, you ask them, what is love? Um, they'll, they'll give you these answers that you find two and a half thousand years ago in Plato's books. Usually Socrates speaks last or close to last. Um, and in the case of the symposium, he definitely speaks, speaks last. He gives his opinion last. In the previous episode, we went through one of these speakers uh, that give, gave a very common uh, opinion, perhaps the dominant opinion in the modern scientific age, which is that love is essentially an imbalance uh, of hormones or juices, as he called them, in the brain. It's essentially something that happens in the brain, which is pretty much for the dare I say, the majority of people understand. And we unpacked that as much as we could in the confines of an hour. So now moving on, um, we have another uh, great speaker. And by the way, a lot of the speakers of uh, the Socratic dialogues were well-known historical figures. They're not fictional figures. Um, they're people who have the, a history of their own. And one of them is Aristophanes, who is um, the master of old comedy. He's the comedy writer, uh, perhaps the most celebrated, um, and wrote many, many uh, works that are very, very current. Uh, I, I encourage modern uh, listeners to read the um, Ecclesiastes or uh, Assembly Women or Congress Women, however it's translated. Very, very modern, very telling of our age. But he wrote a lot of comedy works. And 
uh, he, he appears in this dialogue, the Sivosian, and he appears as a character and he gives his opinion on what is love. And predictably, he gives an opinion that is a little comic. It's a little funny, uh, but that's not all there is. So I'm just going to go through the description and then I'm going to pass it to you, Alex, just for listeners. And the description, what uh, Aristophanes says when asked what is love, goes a little bit like this. He said, I'm going to tell you a myth, essentially. And the myth, the mythos, the story goes like this. Back, way back when humanity was first created, humans, us, we did not look the way we do now. We were actually round like spheres, like balls. And uh, we had four arms and four legs and four eyes. And uh, we uh, great benefits came out of this shape because we could see 360 degrees. We had great strength. And there's a description of how these creatures that were us would move by rolling and bouncing uh, and at great speeds, we were told, so that we could move very fast, although it, a, a little comic as a description, of course, and people can find that on, on, on YouTube and on, on social media. There's a lot of renderings, artistic renderings of uh, Aristophanes' story, which could stand almost as on its own outside of the symposium. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a well-known myth around that time. And uh, these creatures that we were, these round, four-armed, four-eyed creatures, challenged the gods. They're so confident that they were. They challenged the gods and they went up to Mount Olympus um, to fight with Zeus and take over his power. And Zeus, another comic twist, who was very powerful himself, thought that if he were to destroy men as they were, um, he would lose all the sacrifices that men do to him. So he would uh, lose all these benefits. And then uh, he decided to just throw his thunder and split us in two, cut us in two. And uh, he, he did. He cut these creatures in two. And so we became like we look now with two eyes rather than four, two arms rather than four. And um, he gave us a navel at that stitch, if I remember correctly. And so, since that time, we are looking for our other half, which is a very, very common expression. When we meet someone we love, say, I've met my wife, I've found my other half, you know, and it it's, might even come from there. But literally, in, in Aristophanes' story, that like physical, like other half, you were, you were a combined creature and something happened and you were separate. You're looking for the other half. And these creatures started looking for their other half and they wanted nothing but to find it and die in embrace uh, because that's what... So, again, the gods intervened and gave us genitals. <laughs> and so as to... Um, so as, 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 as to be able to detonate this feeling of looking for the other half and actually do some productive work and actually be able to kind of detonate it and do and then the feeling rises again that and that is eros and that's eros and you detonate it and you go back and you do some actual work and that's how we are until today at aristophanes that's the story it's a beautiful story it's a funny story it's a telling story what does it mean for us alex yeah that was a great summary i mean there's there's so much there um and in the interest of time, I think it'll be good to maybe think of it in the most general uh, terms, which is that for Aristophanes, Eros or the the vision of Eros that he presents to his audience is uh, as love of your missing half of your own, right? You are essentially incomplete and what you want is completion, right? And the reason you're incomplete is because the gods made you that way. And what they are directing you to is to coupling and ultimately reproduction. He downplays reproduction. He mentions it, but he doesn't make it thematic in any way. It's not a large part of his speech. He also puts politics in there. Uh, he says that for homosexual uh, men, they'll go off and engage in politics or something like that, right? And so there's a there's a there's a connection there to love of your own, as in love of your own other half and your own children, ultimately, uh, though he has to, again, downplay that for reasons that will come out in Socrates' speech, but then also love of your own community, right? Now, uh, this is meant to be a replacement for this earlier assault on the gods that you mentioned, right, um, which is a desire 
very different from love on your own of your own. It's a sort of desire to transcend yourself wholly and completely, right, and to become a god. Uh, we cannot have that according to Aristotle's myth. We can just couple, fall in love with the other person, reproduce, and all that, um, but ultimately we're left to being mortal. Now, the interesting thing about it is that uh, this desire to be more than human, he presents as a pre-human, right? These sort of blob creatures, that's their desire. Um, and yet it seems to be a very human desire, right? Some mm -hmm. people, uh, their eros will drive them to their own. Some, it will drive them to a love of honor, right? To be um, beloved for, you know, generations. Socrates really makes a lot of that, right? And so, uh, and I think Aristophanes, alludes to this when he says, oh, this, these creatures who assaulted the gods, it's just like uh, what you read in Homer about Ephialtes and Otis, who are, you know, monsters, right? But in the, if you go back to the Iliad, that's used by Dione to comfort Aphrodite, who's just been wounded by Diomedes. So who's the representative of the blob creature? It's a hero, Diomedes, right? So I think Aristophanes is aware that Eros can move above love of your own. But he sees this as essentially volatile, right? And that in the interest of good political order, uh, you need to be obedient to the gods. And that means cutting off arrows or tempering arrows and directing it to love of one's own. Now, there's a lot of interesting implications here. Strauss makes uh, quite a bit of, of how this comic poet actually writes a fairly tragic myth. Um, love of your other half means you can have this sort of completion and there's a kind of beauty to it as you noted but there's also something i think a little bit dark about it which is that ultimately what you want he says is to be fused with your beloved to become one which with you your cannot beloved, have which you cannot have and if you could have it it would mean you just don't want to be yourself that eros is has built into it a kind of sense of your own defectiveness and a desire to overcome or escape that right well wow, that's an amazing it. Yeah, what, yeah, and it can even lead said. to a self-loathing or self-contempt, which is important to recognize this aspect of Eros because that comes out very powerfully in Alcibiades' speech, right? Socrates has made him feel so defective, right? And, and he has a sense that what he takes pride in, specifically his beauty and his abilities, isn't even enough to attract Socrates. And, and so he's got this sort of, the contempt that, uh, Socrates shows Alcibiades turns inward in Al Alcibiades. I think there's a foreshadowing of that here in this desire to fuse and no longer be what you once were. Yeah, that, that, that makes me think of a lot of things because it makes me think how we have this one-dimensional image of, of love in Eros um, that probably comes from, from Romanticism and uh, from the medieval, perhaps, where Eros is... Um, you know, giving us the potion of immortality for a brief moment or, or something. Um, it's a daze, it's a drug, uh, it, literally in the romantic tradition in something like Christian and Isolde, the love potion was presented like a drug, which is taken by Shakespeare as well. In Romeo and Juliet, you know, it's like taking, I don't know, ecstasy, perhaps some uh, Eric modern Eric Simechus would say. Um, but what you're saying is actually true for those who have experienced it. This defectiveness, this other side of Eros that you feel. Um, and, and what you're saying is that it's built in. So, so Eros comes with uh, something that is more than humans can contain, almost, correct? On, on some level, yeah, though I do think human beings um, have a kind of reflective capacity about this, that they can, if they're, I mean, this is dark and it's often suppressed, though it comes out in interesting ways in ordinary experiences of love. Typically in love, and maybe this is a good time to go to Agathon's speech a bit, because mm -hmm. I think the contrast is intentional. I think typically he identifies Eros with being in the beloved and he praises Eros and their Eros seems to be primarily of the beautiful, one's own versus uh, the beautiful. And what, uh, what Agathon argues, um, he argues a few things, but one of the main points he argues is that it's in the beloved. Now, that's a very rosy picture. So you have a dark picture in Aristophanes and then a really rosy, apparently rosy picture in uh, in Agathon. Agathon, yeah, yeah, and, and, and just think, for the listeners, 
v very briefly, Agathon is is yet yeah, another he's been, uh, person. Yeah, he's another he's, poet, tragic poet. He's just tragic. won the contest uh, the day mm. before for the best tragedy, and so he's on uh, cloud nine. Though he just partied also, so I, I like to think of him as he's had the greatest achievement of his life. He's he's celebrated and and felt probably close to a god, if if not a god, and then. He has a hangover and he feels a little human, right? That's what we learned. He's got a hangover. And that's an interesting and, little detail that the, the yeah. symposium, which is sometimes translated as the drinking party, happens during a hangover because it's mentioned in the beginning that the previous yeah. day they had another symposium uh, which, where they drank a lot. And now in this one, they're still going to drink, but they're going to drink just enough. Uh, yeah, so, so the title of the dialogue is Symp Symposion, right, which means drinking together. Oddly enough, uh, only one person calls it a symposion in the uh, in the dialogue itself. The other dialogues are referred to as a sunuzia, which is uh, being together, and it can mean just gathering, it can also mean sex, uh, or a sundepnon, uh, a uh, uh, specifically a dinner, dining together, eating together. So only Alcibiades, who comes in drunk, says, hey, I'm at a drinking party, right? Uh, so it's interesting. Alcibiades and Plato seem to agree on this point, though I think for different reasons. Everybody else, yeah, it's just a gathering. We're just hanging out today. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so Agathon has had this. He's come down. But anyways, uh, the point I'm trying to raise here is that uh, Agathon brings out the experience of seeing the beautiful beloved, and seeing it as the most, seeing this person as the most wonderful thing in the world, as as just promising so much, right? And and you have, I think, we tend to glorify and even deify love, because on a basic level, um, uh, the experience of love first arises in the sight of the beautiful beloved. So it's filled with optimism, with beauty, with promise. Right. And in fact, even when you're rejected, as is so often the case, right? Well, at least in my experience, you're a much handsomer man than I am. But uh, even when you're even when you're rejected, right, there's still an optimism because somebody somebody is beautiful is out there in the world, something that could complete you. Right. Though in those moments, I think you become more aware of the Aristophanic point. Right. Which is that there's a sense of your own inadequacy. Right. But the tendency to glorify love, I think, happens from the fact that the passion arises on in us in in the presence of um, a being that would somehow complete us, right, or render us perfect or, or happy. Finally, right. These are the connotations vaguely present there, and these this is the sort of um, set of psychological parts of the the the. Um, of Eros that are coming out only now in Aristophanes and Agathon's speech. Subtly present earlier, but now they're really focused much more so on the goal of love. Another way to think about it, Strauss makes this point that in all the three first speeches, Phaedrus, Pausanias, and Eryximachus, Eros is subordinated to something. In the third, last three speeches, Aristophanes, Agathon, and Socrates, the end of Eros is intrinsic to Eros. It's love of your own, it's love of the beautiful, that's Aristophanes and Agathon, or with Socrates, ultimately tries to argue at least, Eros is love of the good, properly understood. And this qualifies in his account, love of one's own, love of the beautiful. I have to make, just inspired by what you said, continue this interjection and just turn it a little controversial, but it's something like close to my heart. It's that you mentioned Strauss as in Leo Strauss, the, the great scholar of Greek, uh, Greek philosophy and philosophy. Um, and when Plato wrote uh, about Eros, Plato is a very erotic writer. Okay, the way he writes Eros is not a subject of analysis only it eros pours out of his text like um for some reason whenever i speak about this uh another dialogue comes to my mind which is the second alcibiades um, which is again socrates and alcibiades you know my only wish is to become your lover you know and then there's a very intense scene between the older man and the younger one when leo strauss writes i do not feel eros pouring out 
And I don't know what it is. You have this and you see a picture of Strauss and this very serious the, the man, you know, full of knowledge. How did he enter this erotic world of Plato? It seems to me that he would be more fit, you know, like, and the, here's the controversial part. I always called Strauss the greatest Greek rabbi. Okay, because I think that in his mind he remained very Jewish. And I connected with this lack of eroticism. Like, what is your opinion? So I'm looking right now. There's a, there's a passage. I'm looking for this right now. But there's a passage from the beginning of Al-Farabi's uh, summary of Plato's laws about how, uh, about how um, Plato writes. Let me just read. Uh, uh, he says, uh, here, let me read this. It's a little bit long, but I think this will help. Uh, about the sobriety of Strauss and the uh, apparent eroticism of uh, Plato. Our purpose is for Abi. Our purpose in making this introduction is this. The wise Plato did not permit himself to present and uncover all kinds of knowledge to all people. Therefore, he followed the path of using symbols, riddles, obscurity, and difficulty, lest knowledge fall into the hands of those not deserving of it, and be deformed, and be deformed or into the hands of someone who is not cognizant of its worth or uses it improperly. In this he was correct. Once he knew and became certain that he had become generally known for that, and that it was apparent to people that he expressed everything he intended to say through symbols, he would sometimes turn to the thing he wanted to discuss and declare it openly and clearly. But the one who reads and hears this discussion presumes it is symbolic, and that he intends a meaning different from what he has declared, openly declared. So the idea is that all over Plato, you have all these strange riddles and, and images and things like that. And it's full of these sort of poetic and you could say erotic elements. But hiding within that is the granule of truth, right? The, the deeply embedded truth that is deeply sober and, and, and deeply uh, starkly uh, clear. So, I mean, one thing I would say is, first of all, Strauss is very playful, right? And he enjoys teasing out images. So he has a kind of uh, sort of poetic uh, insight, right? But uh, I, I would challenge a little bit uh, the extent to which Plato is actually deeply erotic. Or if we understand eros, um, what kind of eros do we mean? Because the way that Socrates puts it, uh, eros is not a god, right? Eros is a human capacity that we hope, at least, connects us to the divine. And if it if it could, perhaps then we would attain completion. But ultimately, what we want is the good. And we want the good to be ours. And we want it to be ours, not just now, but in the future. And, if we are so lucky, for all time, always, right? That's the sort of trajectory of the argument that Socrates gives. And the love of the good... Uh, does not strike us at least as 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 erotic right um we're not inclined to say that there's a complete fulfillment the good is often at odds with our visions of beauty and perfection right the good often requires us to sacrifice a little bit and to be realistic right a bit more sober about things and and so one of the things or the problems that emerges in socrates account is he subordinates love of one's own uh, to love of the good. And he also subordinates love of the beautiful to love of the good, right? And he tries to situate them and, and, and collapse them or view them in light of the good. And he tries to smooth over some difficulties. But the, the question I think remains is to what extent does the pursuit of the good satisfy this erotic longing to be forever with our beloved or to attain a kind of beautiful perfection or however you want to put it? To what extent does it satisfy our desire for immortality? That's the the question that Socrates sort of poses. But, but also the question that I would pose two and a half thousand years later is, is there something to the way something is presented that adds to what is presented? Is this erotic tone in Plato just a cover, just a riddle to be solved? Or is it something that is fused with the argument and without which you could not apprehend fully what Plato has to say? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I mean, to go to the end of the dialogue again, right? The same, the, the person who writes by art, comedy, can also write tragedy and vice versa, right? The same person who's, who's a poet by art can do both, right? Now, we don't know why. 
nothing is said there. We just get the sort of thesis and we get that Socrates succeeded in persuading Aristophanes and Agathon of this. But Plato, who presumably, presumably because it's he writes tragic comic uh, sorts of dialogues all the time, right? So the day Socrates dies, there's a there's laughter and, and crying. Socrates laughs, right? So th that's a you know deep mix. Or even this, which is a funny and delightful and charming dialogue, has a very dark uh, um, undertone with the Sicilian expedition and how you know Alcibiades' association with them had something to do with Socrates' trial. Plato seems to, by some kind of knowledge or by art, able to write tragedies and comedies at the same time. Okay. Uh, why does Plato write those? Now, we talked about this last time, but it's worth repeating. Um, Plato's dialogues have a tendency, through all these symbolic and the setting and everything like that, to attract certain readers, right? Um, what is the Republic? It's a, a 10 book dialogue. And what, what happens there? What's the reputation? They build a perfect city, a beautiful city, right? And you're drawn in by the reputation of the book and you read it. And the reason the book has that reputation is because Glaucon pushes it in that direction. So who does the dialogue attract? It attracts people like Glaucon, right? They go there, they hear their deepest wishes expressed, criticized, given voice to and, and elaborated. And then maybe they see their deepest hopes dashed. So that the, the, the presence of beauty in a platonic dialogue is entirely in the service of education in the good. That would be my ultimate. So it's, it's not merely ancillary. It's not just a riddle to be solved and tossed away. It's absolutely essential to attracting the reader, arousing their eros and their, their yearning for, oh, this book speaks to me. This book, this book is for me. It was written for me even 2,500 years ago. They read it, they're following the argument assiduously because this is what they care about most deeply. And then they might realize with Glaucon, oh, maybe if this is perfection, it's impossible. I can't do this, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then maybe they come around to something a little more sober. Uh, maybe they even think past Glaucon's position and come to appreciate what Socrates has done. And that would be the ideal, I think, of a sort of- So it's uh, more of a lure. According yeah. to what you said, it's not in the way that um, Heidegger could not have written any different and still be Heidegger. It's not in that on that level, you think? Yeah, and and I'll, I'll go even further than this. That Platonic, you could call this Platonic poetry. Mm. It's deeply aided by Socratic irony, right? So Socratic irony functions how he he gives in or he decides to cater to Glaucon's desire for a perfect city or Socrates in the symposium. Beautiful, I go to a beauty. Okay, I'm not beautiful, Socrates is saying to himself, nor is the love of the good necessarily beautiful. And that's what I've identified with philosophy. So what do I, what do, I do? I have to beautify myself. And he beautifies philosophy to the extent possible in his speech in the symposium. That's incredibly important as a lure to Agathon. Right? And to the sort of gossips that will pick up uh, the symposium. Socratic irony involves Socrates presenting himself as a certain version of himself, here as both beautiful and good, in uh, the Theatetus as a midwife, right? in the uh, Lysis as a pickup artist. Right? However he needs to appear, he presents himself that way for the purposes of luring in a, 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 an interlocutor, bringing out their opinions, subjecting them to critical scrutiny, and therefore exposing them to the deeper philosophic problems that they've ignored in following their, their irrational desires uh, um, blindly, right? Mm. Uh, so Platonic poetry has that same sort of luring aspect, but it's absolutely necessary to education. You have to, you have to on some level be charmed with a beautiful possibility. You have to allow your hope to, to follow itself and articulate what it wants of the world so that you can then start thinking about it. You either do that yourself or you do it with other people. You, for self-knowledge or for the purpose of living well yourself, you should absolutely be mm. focused primarily on your own views. But yeah, I see Platonic poetry and Socratic irony as working deeply together in this way. Mm -hmm. And that segues nicely to Socrates, um, who speaks last in, in this series, uh, not last in the whole uh, work, but 
in this arc of speakers and that leads to Socrates. What does he have to say, the great Socrates? And it's very interesting to me that Socrates has passed down through the generations as the person who almost introduced logic into the Western world, and the use of logic to break up uh, superstition, to break up the same type of logic that perhaps 2000 years later uh, or 1500 years later, 2000 would be used um, to break the Christian faith and bring a, a more rational world. They, these people in the Enlightenment definitely saw themselves as uh, owing to Aristotle primarily, but from there to Socrates. And in the symposium, perhaps someone would expect a very rational um, explanation of what is love, yet what they get is a myth. And again, to summarize the myth, in short, as short as an erotic dialogue can be, goes a little bit like this. Socrates says, here is how love was born. Okay. The gods had a banquet to celebrate the birth of Aphrodite. And just to get an image, Af Aphrodite in Greek means coming out uh, of, of the foam, of the sea's foam. So you have this almost Botticelli rendered it nicely image of Aphrodite. She was born the goddess of Eros, uh, the goddess of be beauty, uh, erotic beauty, and uh, the gods threw a banquet to celebrate, and everyone we can imagine like this picture, um, every divine creature, the nymphs, the centaurs, the gods, everyone was there. And there was also uh, Plutus, or uh, wealth, uh, who is the, the god of abundance and wealth and obviously he's beautiful and obviously he's larger than life and obviously he drinks a lot and he eats a lot and uh, he drinks too much in fact and he passes out under a table and there walks in penia which is poverty uh, the opposite and of course she's ugly of course she's crooked like a crooked old lady and she's always begging she never has enough to eat and she's all and she went to the banquet this rich banquet to beg to 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 beg for for food for money for gold for whatever and there she sees uh plutos uh iporos the the, the actual name is it in uh passed out and she understands she has a one in a lifetime opportunity to to mate with him so she sleeps with him as he is passed out and she conceives a child you know the two extremes wealth and poverty personified as gods they have a child and that child is eros it's a very strange story and just because it was aphrodite's birthday literally um they assigned it to him so he's almost like a, an a, a adopted child of, of aphrodite and that's how love is born and socrates concludes by that myth that from his mother, from Penia, from poverty, who is his mother, Eros is always a beggar. He always chases after uh, and gets rejected and chases after. And from his father, wealth, he has in, in him the knowledge of beauty. So he recognizes the good, the beautiful, when he sees it and he chases after him but because he, from his mother's side he cannot have it so it's this call he's this constant chasing chasing person beautiful strange myth right so please yeah, take very, it from very 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 strange um so let me i want to bring out something from agathon's speech that i think is picking up on here i'll try to do this connection as quickly as possible Ag so according to phaedrus he cites parmenides and hesiod and he says eros is the oldest god uh, Agathon comes along and says, no, 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 Eros is the youngest god, always with the young. Now, this is a problem because the older gods reproduced how? By Eros. That's why Eros has to be at the beginning, right? Nothing can reproduce unless there's Eros. So, first of all, he says, chaos came to be, which is this, like chasm, basically. And then you have Eros and Gaia and so on. And uh, now, by saying Eros is the youngest god, that means the older poets made it up, right? And Eros is called a poet. And I think what Agathon, there's a lot of steps here, but I'll just assert what I think is the payoff here. Agathon is suggesting that um, there are no gods, right? The gods need Eros. Eros is a poet. The poets made it up that Eros was at the beginning. But really, who's constructing this world? It's the poets, right? The poets are the wise. They make the world. 
behind that is nothing. It's a kind of nihilistic, sophistic account. Which I Agathon did not see, a... by the way. I just saw this for the first <laughs> it's, time. It's an, important, it's an important point, I think, because he's present with the sophists in the Protagoras, right? Now, Socrates just comes right out and says, Eros is not a god, right? So seemingly goes forward. But he keeps the gods in there. He says he connects us to the divine, to the gods. After saying that, right, after bringing up that it's a daimon that connects us to the gods, he then goes into who his mother and father are. And there you get the Porus and Pinea. Now, the strange thing here, okay, is that Pinea is said to be without a lack of resources and so plotted to have a child made out of resource, Poros, right, and would climb beside him and conceived arrows. Poros is drunk on nectar and sleeping outside. Um, now, in explaining why Eros is the son of Penia, poverty, uh, Socrates or Diotima says he is always poor and he is far from being tender and beautiful as the, many believe. This is a reference to Agathon, but it's tough, squalid, shoeless, and homeless like Socrates, always lying on the ground without a blanket or bed. So wait, <laughs> Eros is on a blanket without a blanket or a bed like her, his mother? That was his father. So there's something strange going on here, right? I'll keep going. Sleeping in doors and along waysides in the open air, he has the nature of his mother always dwelling with neediness. But in accordance with his father, he plots. Wait, hold on a second. It was not Poros who plotted, but Penia who was said to mm -hmm. plot. It's the same word, right? To trap the beautiful and good and his courageous. And this, this comes up in a number of ways. But one of the, the difficulties of the myth is that it turns out penia is, or poverty is more resourceful than resource, and war, resource is more impoverished than poverty, right? And so the, the difficulty here, obviously, is that they're giving an account of Eros in terms of erotic coupling, right? So it's presupposing it. But I would suggest that, that what's going on here is that Poros has to sleep outside, right? They were at a feast at Zeus's house, and Poros went into the garden of Zeus. I think the suggestion here is that Eros falls short of the divine. It does not get to the house of the divine. That would be, I think, a subtler, more rationalistic view. Yeah, Eros is not a god. Oh, but it connects us to the divine. Well, how close does it get us to the divine? Divine? Yeah, not close enough, right? I think is the the suggestion here. So he corrects uh, Agathon, spills the beans a little bit on Eros not being a god, but then I think suggests as well that uh, what we want it to connect us to, the divine, or ultimately what takes the place of the divine at the end, the beautiful itself, um, we want it to connect us to that, um, but ultimately it seems like we're going to just fall short of that, right? And that therefore it's a, it should be understood entirely as a human phenomenon, right? This is, uh, I'll incidentally say why I think this is such an important text in the history of philosophy. This is the sole platonic dialogue, as Strauss points on, devoted to a god, right? It seems to be the place, if you want to get the intersection of Jerusalem and Athens, right? Uh, reason and, and um, well, you don't want to revelation. say revelation. Yeah. You want to say revelation, but revelation, we're thinking of law, so we'll think of Plato's laws, right? Yeah. That's the book on uh, you know, that you'd want to look there. But anyways, here you have what is the uh, the case of Athens at its peak about the gods, right? Uh, are gods ultimately, <clears throat> are gods uh, ultimately possible, right? Are they, they conceivable? Um, and insofar as we're conceiving them uh, or our connection to them in terms of Eros, uh, Socrates' answer seems to be, well, if they exist, you know, we're, we're forever at, an, at a distance from them, right? But if they're erotic, then they can't be gods. Mm. The, let's delve into this that you said it's very important for the history of philosophy because, you know, Eros is represented as this in-between being, okay? He's not there, and you said that he cannot even get us there to the absolute ecstasy, the oneness with God, um, but he cannot sit and do nothing either. Um, he needs to, in his very nature, keep on searching, keep on searching, almost knowing that, or, or at least we know that he's never going to get there. Philosophy as a word is philia, sophia, sophia, wisdom, philia, 
well, it's commonly translated as friendship, but it's uh, actually a word for love as well. And it's that yearning. So the reason, you know, Socrates could have called himself wise, or others could have called him wise, so false, but they didn't. They called him philosophers, becoming wise, like ever becoming wise, ever moving, yet never reaching. And Eros is that creature who is Socrates as well. And you said Eros is a very human term, human thing and philosophy. So are we condemned to be this ever searching or is there a way out of this? Is there a resting place? Is there a Buddhist nirvana in philosophy? Well, I think I think I wouldn't call it condemnation, first of all. I don't I don't think that the activity, if it's ongoing and necessarily incomplete, is therefore not good. It might not be beautiful. It might not promise promise us the sort of deep fulfillment and completeness to say nothing of immortality, right? Which is where Socrates goes with this. It might not promise all that that we want, uh, but it might be a sort of human and, and a, a approachable good, right? And an acceptable good in that, in that way. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what more I have, have to say on that other than uh, uh, there, there is a kind of, as an activity, it can be intrinsically pleasant, right? Mm. You do work through certain, you might not uh, fundamentally answer questions and, and get completely wise, but you certainly have a sense of the fact that the problem you started with uh, leads you to a deeper problem you didn't anticipate, mm. one wider in scope, one uh, to which other thinkers, and then you start to read uh, books on these things. I, I, I mean, I'll speak personally here. I, I mean, I remember the first time I read a Platonic dialogue that I really said, sensed had this sort of uh, um, capacity to sort of show me my own faulty presuppositions because it spoke to my presuppositions so much. And it's it's an ama amazing amount of gratitude you feel that somebody wrote a book which, like which this. Which book was that? This was the Parmenides for me. Okay. But uh, yeah, that, that dialogue, <laughs> well, it was the one I did my dissertation on because I was really inclined to it uh, upon initially reading it. But you start you start working uh, through it, and you start to to see that somebody's written something that can show you your presuppositions and 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 brings you along the way, and you and you feel uh, a deep friendship, even right, a friendship that's entirely viewed in light of this ability to make progress. You could say individual, and it's necessarily individual and personal in this sense. Um, because there's a sort of shared questioning and a shared concern with these deeper problems of human existence. Yeah, and I think it was either in the Parmenides or the Sophist uh, that uh, that very, very famous line was spoken um, where, where it said, um, and in Greece, it said, when, when we were young, and that comes from an old philosopher, not Socrates, but the Sophist, is when we were young, we took being for granted. Um, being to just be to be the things are all around us they yet that that's come yet now he says that we're older uh we wonder about this about being uh, just something as simple as the table existing uh yeah. right before me yeah and 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 there's a there's a, a sense of your own ability to understand these problems but also a forever sort of dogged awareness. I, I wrote about this in, when I, in my book on the Parmenides, but there's always the question of whether the problem as you've understood it is the deepest version of that problem. I'm, I'm finishing up a, a manuscript on the trilogy right now. And one of the things I came to realize in studying the Theotetus is that Parmenides imparted to Socrates a problem in the Parmenides that Socrates then imparts to Theotetus. And there's a sort of ability to reproduce the same sort of enduring questions in a different person's concerns. Theotetus is a young mathematician, right? And in this sense, there, and that's not like Socrates, who is concerned with the reputation of philosophy in the Parmenides. And that's not like Parmenides, right? Who's concerned with understanding the limits of rationality, of trying to understand the whole as such, unity as such, right? 
Um, yet they're all in a way concerned with similar problems, whether it's the unity of being in Parmenides, the unity of the ados or form in Platonic, you know, Platonic metaphysics, or in, if it's uh, the question of the mathematics mathematicize ability or, or methodical ability to extend method beyond mathematics, right? Something the Atheus is reluctant to do, right? The sense that knowledge might just be perception beyond mathematics. Mm -hmm. This, uh, this all uh, involves questions concerning unity and a kind of kinship in this questioning, albeit from very different perspectives. And there's a, there's a friendship that can come from that, an awareness of one's own progress, but also a, a kind of understanding that that however much progress you've made it might just be your version of the problem right mm -hmm. this is where we get to very it's almost like heideggerian territory but i think there's some deep affinities between heidegger and strauss when it comes to more than it seems uh, on the question of historicism and stuff but i do think that they understand strauss understands uh and this is certainly a platonic notion on my reading at least that all all questioning or all understanding of problems necessarily are problems for certain opinions. And opinions have a kind of conventional, we would say historical, but I think conventional is a better term, conventional determination, right? Um, and your duty or your task as a philosopher is to find those problems lurking in your opinions, right? This is what a platonic dialogue is. Somebody says, I think courage is this, right? And then they find a problem in the opinions, right? They get out of the opinions a whole conversation. But there is still this sort of contingency that's there. There's still the occasional aspect where you have to begin from your opinions and, and find those, those problems lurking in it. And they'll always be stated somewhat in those terms, right? It, latently in those terms. But that doesn't, I think that doesn't preclude you from feeling a deep kinship and even being able to understand the thought of somebody who wrote 2,500 years ago. Mm. I think actually the, the problems make that possible. But also the the idea that Strauss revived, uh, a very ancient idea that the philosophical life is the higher life for humans. Uh, how can this be if this is always by definition incomplete? You know, and I'm, I'm ju just going to throw this ending up on this great conversation. I mean, I, I challenge you to find a human life that is complete. I mean, the completeness or incompleteness of a life seems to be a, a, a universal human problem. The question then is how to, how best to live with this incompleteness, mm. right? Well, and it's also, I mean, one of the also one of the paradoxes, and I'm borrowing here from Michael Davis, who is, I guess he was a teacher of mine. I was a colleague of mine, but I learned so much from him. He really feels like a teacher. Um, but he points out with death that death seems to be obviously a bad thing, yet it's the primary motivating factor and, and engine of, of urgency in any task that you undertake seriously as a human being. And so it seems like, you know, the cause of all the good things is this bad thing that renders life finite, mm. contingent. If, if we didn't die, there would be no reason to do anything at all because you'd have all yeah. the time to do it, it again so. well that's a good segue because the reason i'm mentioning it you know i agree with you uh and i like how you went boom you know show me a complete life but the myth of this complete life i think exists more than ever because i see all around me you know we could have yet another conversation for this at some point in the future but for now suffice to say that i see some worrying signs um, in the culture that I live, as in the greater Western culture, they are not always apparent. And one of these is a deep yearning for an Eastern type of completion, an Eastern type of transcendence. Since the 1960s, there's obviously a great documentary on Netflix called uh, and, uh, Wild, Wild, um, Wild Wild Country with uh, a man called Osho being uh, this in in Indian guru. Um, and there's many, many gurus, and they always promise, implied or explicitly, this resting point that there's some kind of term called nirvana, oneness, oneness, this point where people seek it in psychedelics, where you become like the gods, or you realize that you were a god all along, just playing a game. And this, this idea has become so prevalent in the West that this is why I'm asking this constant incompleteness of Socrates is overshadowed by this image of the Buddha now. So, so, so what do you think is happening there? You know, I, I mean, this, this will take the conversation in a more political direction, which I don't mind, but I have a sort of, 
hobby horse or thesis that a lot of the philosophies and experiences that are becoming more attract attractive right now are all indications of the um, what's the way to put this the the sort of oppressive universality of our regime obviously that we have great freedoms in the u.s right so uh, i don't want to overstate you know I, when i see some people complain about tyranny and, and elites sometimes i'm like all right well relax you still <laughs> can complain about this there's yes. obviously a, a heavy dose of freedom but i think there is a sense that you're sort of stuck working for jobs in these larger universe there's no connection or community on the particular level and so th there's a few things trends that have become popular among, among young people let me begin with one which is sort of uh the trad group going back to being sort of uh almost uh obnoxiously traditional in one's religious beliefs right and and trying almost going medieval and mm. so there's there's a kind of knee-jerk Christianity. Um, there's a desire to go and try to create small communities, which actually sounds healthy, but I think is also a form of escapism. Mm -hmm. There's the attraction of Stoicism, which mm -hmm. I think also explains the attraction to Eastern uh, teachings a lot of the time, this ability to sort of disassociate from possessions in the outside world as best as you when, can. When you have less and less because of inflation. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then and then finally, uh, I would include even the psychedelic stuff, um, or even the going to space stuff. Right? There's there's a, a real disconnect from your immediate surroundings and community that I think speaks to a grave sort of illness, psychic illness that we have as a people. That and, and look, I, I sympathize with it. I mean, I I struggle to find in my community much to care. Now, I have very good colleagues and I have friends and I have all sorts of relationships. And, you know, I'm not the kind of person that needs to live in the most splendid local feeling place, right? It doesn't, I, I love to live in those places, but still, uh, I don't, you know, I lived in New Orleans and I could never trick myself into caring about all the things they cared about um, down there, like the parades in, in the same way. But uh, yeah, the, the, that sense of needing an escape and specifically the attraction to take just Christianity and, and I'm not saying this is true of all Christians, but Christianity and Stoicism, these arose in the Roman Empire, right? For obvious reasons mm -hmm. that, that these ideas, true or not, had traction then. And I think that might be part of the appeal that they have now. And I think it's, it's uh, you know, lamentable. It speaks to a kind of grave dissatisfaction with our way of life and i think you hit it in the head in the first first part of this of this uh of of, of your speech where you said uh, it's it's the regime you know and uh like what i've learned at least from political philosophy and following this straussian line down the to machiavelli is you need to understand society from the top very counter scientific you need to understand the regime is the whole and everything will fit into place. It's it's no secret that part of on tyranny um, is was almost like a knee jerk reaction to the whole COVID lockdowns. Um, too big of a subject to tackle here. I'd love to do it later on, but um, I posted an image of a uh, you know uh, Sharia wearing woman, and I sliced it and I collaged it to a woman wearing a face mask. And at that time, it became apparent that. Um, Islam as well is one of these universalist tendencies that a universalist regime like our globalist regime would find useful and use. I mean, maybe. I mean, there's a, the, the, the problem with the problem with the, the, the globalism and, and all that is it's so deeply embedded with capitalism and therefore liberalism that it, it's, it strikes me that Islam struggles with this, especially you see this in the politics of Many, many advanced Middle Eastern uh, Yeah, countries. more like a... So look, you know, we need to unravel this and we need to go back to that watershed moment between the ancients and the moderns and try to uh, break it. I think what we did here uh, is definitely not a summary of uh, this person that would be that would be uh, an insult um, to whoever did actual summaries. It's, it's a poster. It's a poster. We painted a poster and we hang it on the <laughs> wall and say, look... We, we invite people to come and read it. I would love to thank you very, very much for the second part. And I would love to have more of these conversations. Um, sure thing. Thank you for soon. having me, Michael.
Um, one more time, where, where can people find you? Uh, just go to my Twitter, Alex Priou, P R I O U. Um, post my work on there and then check out my podcast, uh, The New Thinkery. That's Think E R Y. Uh, we okay. do history of political philosophy. Great, great stuff. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have many of these and uh, right. we'll, we'll keep philosophizing. Okay. <laughs> great. Thank everyone, you, Michael. For everyone listening, this was On Tyranny. Stay safe and keep philosophizing.